Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting in just a few moments. I'll let you all get logged in and join the webinar. Seeing lots of people attending. Great, and with that, I will get started. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday today on April 24th. My name is Amanda Delory. I'm the Member Programs Coordinator at Digital Health Canada, and I'll be your host today. So this session is part of the Web Webinar Wednesday Healthcare Innovation Round Series and has been certified for Main Pro Plus credit. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we're on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We gratefully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. And we are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. So please go ahead and share in the chat the territory that you are joining us from. All right, let's get into it. Today's webinar is Navigating Administrative Burden, Meaningful Digital Health Solutions for Community Family Medicine. And it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters for the day. We have Dr. Claire Liddy. Dr. Liddy is a practicing family physician and the digital clinical lead for Ontario Health co-leading the Patients Before Paperwork Initiative. Dr. Liddy is the co-founder of the award-winning Champlain e-consult base service based in Ottawa, which is recognized internationally as an evidence-based approach to electronic consultations between clinicians. In 2018, the Ontario Ministry of Health funded the program, making it available province-wide. To date, the Ontario eConsult program has facilitated timely access to specialist advice for over 500,000 patients. Dr. Liddy's research has resulted in over 200 publications in peer-reviewed journals and 470 conference presentations. Through her program of research, Dr. Liddy has acquired over $37 million of peer-reviewed grant funding, including $12.2 million as a principal investigator. Her work has improved access to and quality of care for many underserved and vulnerable populations in both urban and rural communities, including patients with frailty, dementia, Parkinson's disease, and long-term care residents. We also have Dr. Chandi Chandrasena. With over 20 years of specialization in comprehensive family medicine, Dr. Chandrasena deeply understands the challenges of community practice. She has a special interest in physician leadership and professional accountability, advocating for a robust primary care and focusing on end users to alleviate inadvertent technological burdens. Dr. Chandrasena has contributed to numerous national and provincial conferences, webinars, and discussions on digital technology, burnout, and administrative burden. As Ontario MD's Chief Medical Officer, she provides the clinical perspective to inform digital health products and services for physicians. She plays a key role with digital health technology, clinician engagement, change management, and education, and is actively involved in provincial and national discussions on EHR integration and data interoperability. So thanks for everyone for joining today. And I will now pass the mic over to our presenters to begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having us here. Um, Amanda, thank you for managing my slides. So next slide, please. Uh, so by the end of this talk, we're hoping you'll understand what we mean by administrative burden on community physicians, because you hear this term quite a bit. Um, and we're hoping by the end of this talk, you'll really understand what that means. And you'll also understand why this is a problem for everyone to solve. Um, we hope also by the end that you'll develop an approach to developing digital health tools for the community and what factors to consider when creating them.
Um, and you should also learn by the end about government, government initiatives and innovative approaches to reduce administrative burden, highlighting Ontario Health's patients before paperwork. Next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so uh, since Amanda kindly introduced me, I don't need to go through this, but I have no conflicts to declare. Next slide, please. So what are you hearing in the news? Next slide, please. So not a day goes by that you don't see an article or a headline about doctor shortages or a clinic closing or another family doctor so burnt out that they have no choice but to walk away. So the Ontario College of Family Physicians in 2022 stated that 2.2 million patients are without a family doctor in Ontario, and that'll be 3 million by 2025. So that's next year. Next slide, please. So why should we take administrative burden seriously? It's affecting the primary care. It's affecting primary care. And primary care is the bedrock of the healthcare system. So if we don't address this now and quickly, we won't have a functioning healthcare system. So the OCFP survey quantified what family docs always knew. We spend 19.1 hours per week on administration and that 94% of doctors are completely overwhelmed with their clerical tasks and their administrative burden. And that's time we could be spending with patients. Next slide, please. The Canadian Medical Association National Physician Health Survey in 2021 showed high levels of burnout across the country, low professional fulfillment and worsening mental, mental health. And 49% said they would reduce clinical hours in the next two years, which actually brings them to now. So uh, some we're experiencing that right now. And this time spent was equivalent to 55.6 million patient visits. 55.6 million patient visits. I just want you to understand that. Next slide, please. So what does this mean and how can we change this? Next slide, please. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this slide because um, I'm gonna tell you what a typical day is like in my clinic. So my day would actually start the night prior. And if it was a Monday, it would start on a Sunday. So I would log into my EMR and I would deal with the many, many, many messages. There's requests for prescription refills, requests for letters or notes or forms, requ requests for massage, counseling, physio notes, requests for referrals to various specialists. I would look at the inbox and also look at all the test results that have come in that I've ordered. So those would be my labs. Maybe there were x-rays that you went for. These are what I've ordered on the panel of patients that I'm responsible for. So all that imaging comes in and I would look at it when it comes in. And then I would act on the results. So I would look at it. I would say, oh, I need to do something about this. And then I would send messages either to patients or to my staff to action them. I would read all the consult notes from their specialists, their physio, their dietitian, and now their pharmacist. I would update my CPP. So I would then go into my EMR and update your list, your medication list and everything. And that has to be done manually. Um, and then I would action whatever I had to. Then I would look ahead of my next day and maybe the days ahead. And I would see, is there is why are my patients coming in? Or, or do I have the information I need? So if you were coming in to see me about diabetes, I would check to see that you've done your lab work. And if it wasn't there, I would have my staff call you and say, hey, can you please go for your lab work? And I may actually have to reschedule the appointment so that we're not wasting your time or our, my time. And that way we can get the most out of the visit. And if you're coming in for lab results, I would make sure they're in the chart. And if they're not, I would go to OLIS in Ontario and I would download it or whichever lab repository it is in your province. Um, and if they recently went to the hospital, I would see if I had those reports. And usually I have to say in Ontario, that's not a problem. We have many, many, many hospital reports, usually pages and pages. Sometimes they're duplicates and sometimes they also fax them to me just to make sure I have them. But regardless, I do check to make sure I have them. If I'm missing anything, I have to log on to a separate viewer and then download them. And it's not integrated. So what I mean by download is I have to put them on my desktop, import them into my EMR, put them into my EMR, and then review them. I would also look ahead to see if you're due for anything from a prevention point of view, your immunizations, your mammograms, your PAPs, your colon cancer screening. And then I would check to see the last time that I saw you. Um, and I would do this for all my patients that are coming in the next day. And if I wasn't too tired, I would do the day after. 
And this is actually before I've even actually seen a patient. So the next day I would get into the office early. I would look at my inbox again because there's new reports and labs and requests. And then I would deal with the urgent messages that come in and the people that need to be fitted in. And then I would start my day. And when I see you in my office, I'm charting, I'm writing down what you say, I'm checking my inbox, I'm answering your questions, I'm counseling, I'm solving your problems. But then by the end of the day, this all happens again, and I'm charting and I'm finishing everything. So the messages are never ending. So for every hour of patient care, there's one hour of administration. So with technology, it's so easy to send me info, 15 pages of discharge summaries, forms, um, anything, because it's seamless. And we get these reports as PDFs, and I have to open and read them all. Um, and then I have to open, read them all, and summarize them and type them in. Why? Because my EMRs don't read PDFs automatically, and they're not searchable. So the only way I can find those results again is if I tag them or do something with them. And like I said, oftentimes there's duplicate reports, so I have to kind of see which ones are more accurate. So now my average patient visit for me is 15 to 20 minutes, and that doesn't even cover the administration part of things. So let me tell you, when my kids were young, I remember going to school to pick up my kids. I would take them home. I would get them settled. And then I would settle with my EMR from 8.30 to 12 o'clock every night just to finish all this paperwork. And then if it was a Monday, I would use Sunday to do the catch up. And now that my kids are teenagers, the reports are just getting worse. Um, so when the surveys come up showing that the numbers are 19 hours of extra admin work, this is what they mean. Our technology is so fragmented. It's not integrated. It's not seamless. There's a lot of clicks and the burden and time we're overloaded with too much information. So that's why you see that 94% of family docs are burdened and why family docs are walking away from their practices because it's the only way they can, they, they can do anything. And so just because you can send me information doesn't mean you should. So we didn't go into medicine for paperwork. Um, we went into medicine because of patients. That's why not to do all this charting and our new grads are not choosing family medicine. And this is one of the reasons why. Um, so we're balancing quite a bit. So patients are more complex, higher patient demands and needs, and then the administrative piece that I just went through. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I was also, I also sat on the OMA, the Ontario Medical Association, which is our association in Ontario, they had a burnout task force, and they released a white paper called Healing the Healers, and they came up with five health system recommendations, and they made it quite clear that physician burnout is a health system problem and not a me problem or a clinic problem. And their recommendations as it related to technology was promoting seamless integration of technology into our workflows and reducing documentation and administrative burden. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? It means we need to evaluate the burden. We need to find ways to reduce it. Do you need to send me 15 pages for an ER visit? Do you need to send me five copies? Can we use scribes? And I know we're going to talk about AI scribes a little bit later. Can you help with documentation? Can you look at other innovations? Can we make referrals easier and seamless? And can technology actually save me time and promote EMRs and workflows that actually work? And having interoperability standards, it's not putting the burden on physicians to be data entry clerics. Um, we have to look at the technology for that. And most importantly, what they're saying is that physicians have to, are key partners and they have to be there in the start and provide ongoing training and tech support. I just want you to pay attention to the last part of, of this statement. I know the slide's very busy, but this one's really important. Have physicians as key partners from the start in the procurement, design, implementation, and ongoing optimization of digital health tools to ensure usability. It's not a one and done. Next slide, please. Ontario MD has been doing an annual survey and assessing digital health challenges and burnout. And this is our 2022 survey. So the top five challenges about two years ago, usability, integration with your EMR and tools, communication among doctors and clinicians, time and patient met engagement. When we asked docs to rate their burnout is around seven to eight out of 10. And the top five causes, inbox and admin, integration, compatibility of tools, time and speed to do things, 
duplication, redundancy, and documentation. I think you're hearing a theme here as I'm going through my slides. Um, and by the end of it, you're gonna hear my voice in your head every time you look at technology. Um, this next survey, so the next slide, please. So this one um, is our survey from this year. It just closed in March. It's a bigger survey we did with Dalhousie and it's right hot off the presses. Um, we had uh, 1,373 respondents in Ontario and we asked them to rank 10 administrative tasks from least so most burdensome to least. And it, interestingly, we opened this survey, we got over a thousand respondents within a week. Trying to get doctors to do anything within a week is, is hard to do. But the fact that they opened an email, did a survey, and then actually took time to send us messages to say thank you for doing this survey, that speaks to this, the, the stress that this is causing. So the top three ranked were managing reports sent through your EMR, managing communications related to patient care and inputting data into your EMR. The others were really managing redundancy, logging into different platforms, so no portals, please, and switching between platforms, managing patient information, and just figuring out how to use the technology. Um, so Ontario MD actually uses these needs assessment surveys to inform our education offerings our digital advocacy and also new products and services that are developed really to meet these needs. Next slide, please. So last spring, OMA identified administration burden as part of their prescription for Ontario and these immediate actions or solutions that, um, that could help alleviate this burden. Um, and interestingly, when you look at these immediate solutions, centralized intake and referral system, streamlining forms and reduce sick notes and referral letters, explore AI scribes and improve those hospital reports that I was talking about that come through HRM in Ontario. And, and these are all solutions that are actually underway right now. Next slide, please. So it's again, it's interesting how many organizations and surveys and needs assessments are pointing towards the same thing. And it's been pointing towards those things now since 2021, 2022, sorry, 2020, 2021. And now we're 2024 and we're still saying the same things. Um, and it really speaks to the reliability of the information, but also what you can do as an innovator, as a vendor, as a supporter, as a stakeholder. Next slide, please. So when a problem lacks a solution, it leaves a gap. And we rush to fill it with fragmented, oh, sorry, I think I missed a, the slide back, please. We rush in to fill it with fragmented siloed fixes or technology. But without a clear roadmap and clear understanding of the problems, these solutions can actually make the problem worse and create more burden. And that's really what's happening. Next slide, please. So I was also part of the Administration Burden Working Group, the ABWG, that was led by the Canadian Medical Association, which looked at improving physician wellness and reducing admin burnout. And they came out with their recommendations in November 2023. So the membership was pan-Canadian, and it was chaired by Dr. Kathleen Ross, who's the president of the CMA. Next slide, please. So this is an excerpt. I'm not going to read it all. It's very uh, dense. But this is the excerpt from the report um, that looked at um, technological challenges. So what the ABWG identified was five major root causes of physician admin burden. And these root causes stem from the design of the healthcare system, its evolution, and the pressures that it faced historically and also now. So the five root causes were human factor, patient expectations, workforce challenges, system challenges, and technolo technology challenges. So I'm going to focus on the, on the tech challenges. So tech challenges refer to the codification, design, implementation of technology tools to support physician practices, but they have in turn created that burden. So these are tech solutions that were meant to save time, which in fact increased our burden. Next slide, please. So, you know, when I used to go to lectures, I still do. I mean, what, what do I mean when I used to? I, I'm still learning all the time. I loved it when the medical lecturer would say, if you didn't listen to anything I told you, this is what I want you to listen to. So I'm telling you, if you didn't hear anything I told you, this is what I want you to hear. Um, the root cause um, of tech, of tech, like the root causes of technology challenges. So this is really important to understand. Um, and these causes are associated with design of tools and infrastructure that lack interoperability, that require duplicative actions that aren't efficient, so they're inefficient, and they're not fully able to capture the nuances of clinical workflow. 
And this is partly due to a technology system, like technology system designers and architects having limited line of insight into the realities of clinical workflow. And then they're building systems that em emulate our workflows without actually fully understanding them. So that's kind of the key problem is really the people that are building the workflows that are developing the technology don't really understand the end use piece of it. And this is compounded with the fact that physicians are not often co-designers, consultants, or voices in infrastructure design for their own workflow. So this is something that was echoed in Healing the Healers, that paper I talked to you about from the OMA. And it's really about co-design and bringing physician voice earlier, understanding the problem, and making sure the solution doesn't add more burden. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Claire Liddy, who is now going to talk about what government can do and how to alleviate this burden in another way. So Claire, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Tandy. And it certainly resonated with me. And I, I go in and I do clinic and I'm a little bit slower now. I've been around a bit longer, but it definitely four hours of seeing patients um, causes another at least four hours of administrative uh, work for me. And before I used to be able to you know, do a full day um, with maybe I would say one or two hours out of, you know, seeing patients for seven hours. And that has a huge impact on the number of patient visits um, and the efficiency of the system. And again, I will just refer back as I go through this um, to thinking about uh, what's happening in, in our country these days in terms of lack of access. So I think one of the key messages that I wanna give is that if we actually can work together and be more aggressive in terms of um, trying to address these administrative burdens, it will result in improved access to the primary care uh, system for our population. So with that, I'll go to the next slide, please. And I think again, yeah, if you've had the bio, um, multiple hats that I'm wearing. I, I am the chair of the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa also. And uh, one of the things there, again, that we're looking at is about the education in terms of our, our undergraduate students and a, a lot of work on the digital side that, that we could be doing on that. Um, we'll move to the next slide. I'm paid for some of my time with Ontario Health and also still leading evaluation work on e-consult, so I have a stipend for that. Um, and where I can declare that I don't have a conflict of interest, or these are just sort of supported positions, but I'm, I, I have no tech companies or anything like that in terms of uh, industry, even though um, I'm working in the digital world. And I think that maybe is part of uh, what we're saying is that a lot of what we need to do in digital is not actually about creating a digital tool. It's about being able to design the systems uh, that are gonna work together. Next slide. So lots of surveys and lots of headlines. Um, I think what I'm trying to gonna convey today is that we have a lot of hope actually, and there is in fact a tremendous amount of progress being made. And we as family doctors in Canada are really happy that we got all those headlines because I think now what we've got is a collective call to action. And the more that we can work together um, across the provinces, across the sectors um, and as individuals, then I think the better off we will be. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give a bit of a snapshot of what's happening across Canada, and then I'll do, um, or I'm, and I, I'm also going to talk about what we're doing in Ontario. So this just gives you a sense, um, really, of the activity and some of the, I think, policy uh, declarations and uh, different provinces that are initiating and have done quite a bit of work looking at administrative burden. Um, and I'll give a little bit more detail in particular on what Nova Scotia is doing in a few minutes. And then the really good news is that Ontario also is doing a lot and uh, has progressed, I think, a tremendous amount since um, the Patients Before Paperwork program was initiated in early 2023. So let me get into the detail of that. Uh, next slide, please. And we'll move the next move to the next slide. So just again, to contextualize it in the Ontario landscape, um, this is a recent slide on any given day in Ontario. So today, um, you know, 161,000 people are visiting um, GP or they're in the primary care sector. 75,000 will see a specialist. And again, that's all generally in the community, maybe some going to uh, ambulatory care in the hospital. We order 59,000 x-rays, 17,000 emergency department visits. 7,000 CT MRI scans, and then about 3,000 inpatient visits. 
So one of the things that I like to just draw attention to is that a lot of the investment and focus when we're talking about digital tools is often uh, within the hospital sector, less focus and attention within the community. And what Chandy and I are talking about is really bringing that voice of the primary care provider, the family medicine specialist, nurse practitioner, other community providers, and saying that if we actually want to decrease administrative burden, we need to be uh, focusing our efforts in the primary care sector. So that's what we're trying to do in Ontario. And a lot of the work that um, I'm leading with others is, is trying to improve, I think, some of the issues that Chandy had raised in terms of the admin burden. We know in Ontario also that there's a population growth. So already from the beginning, when I started doing some work in digital, we were using 14 million as the population of Ontario. It's, it's above 15 million now. And again, um, we also know, as Chandy had said, that there is an increasing demand for primary care. So we need to think out of the box. We have to be innovative. And then anything that we're gonna be doing on the digital side does need to have the voice of the clinician, the voice of the patient, um, really involved right from the beginning in terms of co-design and understanding, I think, where people are being seen, where is the demand, where is the volume in terms of healthcare delivery. Next slide, please. In February of 2023, how did, how did we get to patients before paperwork? This was an announcement from uh, Minister Jones, who announced we're finally fa axing the facts. So that was some of the language being used uh, at the beginning of this program. And there was really a launch of an initiative to get rid of the fax machine, um, whilst not increasing the admin burden, but trying to make, I think, the system um, more eff effective and more efficient. And this came out, as I said, a plan for connected and convenient care. And this is what led to uh, the launch of the program that I'm co-chairing. Next slide, please. There was a lot of background work that was done uh, in Ontario, which identified four main areas. So this is really where we're focusing in Ontario in terms of the, removing the fax machine. Um, and these four main areas generate 80% of uh, fax usage in the healthcare system. So we're looking at referrals, prescriptions, uh, how do you view and order labs, diagnostic imaging, and also looking at the forms that, uh, that we use. And um, you can refer to this. This is a, a you know a, a very interesting way of taking a look at where we could then have impact. Um, next slide, please. So patients before paperwork then was uh, launched, and it is intended to be a five-year initiative. It's clinically led, um, so clinical and digital, which is really a new way of doing things, very exciting. And the main focus is to try to reduce fax usage and administrative burden for frontline providers. Um, we've just completed the planning stage now and really are looking for 24, 25 and beyond to be uh, actioning quite a few things. And uh, there is a lot of activity and I've got hot off the press slide at the end of uh, uh, this presentation that I'll show you that was just released actually at 1030 this morning in Ontario. So I'll, that's a little teaser. Next slide, please. Now everybody's Googling what's been happening. So we've established what the vision for the program is. Um, and on the left, really it's within five years, we're looking at delivering safer, timely, more equitable care for Ontarians and improving the provider experience by reducing administrative burden for clinicians. Uh, guided on the right, you see a diagram which really depicts the quintuple aim. So very much looking in terms of the patient experience, improving the provider experience of care. These programs and anything that we do should uh, present good value for Ontario. Um, it should advance health equity and overall we're hoping to improve population health. Um, on the use of faxes in terms of the safety piece of it, I think that's one of the most compelling reasons why we need to um, uh, to change what we're doing right now. It's because it really is um, unsafe. It leads to lots of uh, errors in terms of when things are faxed, missed reports, um, and 50% of the complaints to the Privacy Commissioner in Ontario are related to fax. So that, again, is one of the reasons why Ontario has um, launched uh, the, this initiative. The exciting thing from a clinical point of view is that advancing the vision actually is we're invited as clinicians. So we have been invited to, to get in there as clinicians and it, we need to be clinically leading this 
in order to lead to transformational change. And I'm gonna just speak a little bit to that about how we're going about that. And that's really a lot of my role is to try to harness and bring in the clinician voice. Next slide, please. So we're not talking just about digital products, but actually about how the digital products are used. And what we are looking at are trying to understand how things can be bundled together. Um, what do you need to sign off in terms of legal agreements? Um, what's the liability? I remember on um, some of the earlier tools when we were looking at it as a clinic, you know, we had a big debate about we don't have enough liability insurance. Our coverage is only 2 million for these things. This tool requires 5 million in liability. And again, very difficult or you know, challenging conversations to have as a group of clinicians. Um, and what we would like to be trying to do in Ontario is actually to have that in a very uniform way so that then individual clinicians are not the ones who have to um, tackle whether or not they've got the right liability. We want people to be able to use the digital health tools in a really easy way to have appropriate uh, tech support, uh, practice support to be able to use them. Um, there's no point in um, having, you know, what I call my analogy is a new car in the driveway, but actually I don't have enough money and I can't buy any fuel. And by the way, I also don't have a driver's license. So from an Ontario perspective, what we're looking to do is to really create that whole experience, which looks at that. Um, the land acknowledgement this morning just made me reflect again on some individual things that I've been hearing about, even the lack of uh, broadband connectivity in some of our rural and northern communities, um, and the, the uh, having equipment, which is again very, you know, usable, but you don't even have actually a backup generator to power that equipment. So I think we have to look at what the foundation pieces are and not forget that um, you need to have all of those things in place in order to be able to actually have um, adoption and then usability of digital health products. So that's what we're looking at in Patients Before Paperwork. Next slide, please. So what's changing? We're really looking at the customers um, and that's framed as the primary care providers or clinicians, the specialists, and then also our Ontario health teams, independent health facilities and the hospitals. What you can see is hoping that to primary care clinicians are going to see value and all be adopting um, digital alternatives to reduce paper and fax-based tools that we will have basically centralized and, and very good intake channels for um, new referrals and central intake model are some of the things we're working on. And then from the side of the receiving sites, looking at having much more standardization in terms of referral pathways. On the Ontario Health side, again, the ideas I had talked about is that we're going to bundle things together, have a very customer service approach, try to um, simplify, I think, the methods that you sign up, the legal agreements, privacy, et cetera, um, really work on connecting um, things better across the system, and then also being able to have a whole integrated strategy. The idea is that wherever you are in Ontario, you would be able to access these digital health tools um, and the experience of how you use them and what you're able to offer and how it will be helpful to you will be the same whether you're in Northern Ontario, whether you're in Cornwall, Ontario, whether you're in Ottawa, Toronto, or London. Next slide, please. I was trying to change my slide on my uh, computer. Um, so one of the things that a lot of the team is working on is the change management approach and really leading towards uh, from what is often siloed, where you have change management teams who are linked to separate digital health tools or separate organizations that we are working in a much more coordinated way, and then ultimately that this is networked. And so the concept would be that uh, you would be able to uh, have a team that's going to be able to meet you where you're at. And again, if you're a community that actually needs help, you know, in terms of broadband connectivity, you need to be looking at solutions on that just to be able to have reliable access for your digital health tools, then we would like to work with you on that. Or if you're a community that is much more advanced and, you know, you need some help in terms of getting um, more uh, specialists, let's say, available on an electronic referral system, then we would like to be able to help you with that as well. Um, so more work to come, and it is quite a bit to um, put all the pieces together for a large province such as Ontario, but we've made some really good progress with the team. Um, moving along. 
So addressing the root causes and bringing back to, uh, you know, what Chandy was was highlighting that it's so important that uh, any kind of digital work brings in the, the um, physician voice and the clinician voice early on in order to understand not only what the current workflow is, where the potential is to improve the workflow, variability of how we do things, um, but also to design products that are actually going to address the gap. Um, so what's really nice uh, for me and one of the reasons why I was interested in taking on this role was that it was real invitation to uh, bring the clinical voice in. And I started uh, just in essentially late summer, uh, fall of 2023, and uh, we were able to host uh, three clinical focus groups, which then led to the establishment of a clinical advisory table. Um, and that's co-chaired now uh, with myself and Dr. Keeley. Um, and we're still uh, bringing in some additional clinical voices into that clinical advisory table. And then as of April 2024, so just three weeks ago, uh, brought on four additional family doctors who are the clinical leads who are working within my team. And what we've been doing is we had been invited as clinicians to actually be then um, co-leading or partnership with um, the digital folks in the various work streams that are highly aligned with what the use cases are for reducing facts. So we have a lab work stream, electronic prescription work stream. We're looking at medical notes. Uh, we're looking at electronic forms and also obviously referral. Um, so very significant progress. I'll move along to the next slide. These are just some highlights of what we've done over the last few months and where we've been able to bring in the clinician voice. I won't go through all of them, but it really is, again, helping to identify what are the current state in terms of the pain points. So I spoke a bit to that. What are the product priorities? What are we already using that uh, is uh, are working well or could be enhanced a bit? Highlighting also the administrative forms. And administrative forms really is not about digitizing forms, but we need to get rid of um, a lot of them. And uh, again, some really great work happening on that. And then also the change management experience. So looking at how to leverage the structures of the Ontario health teams, primary care, care networks, exploring concept of practice support, practice facilitation. And then as I had already uh, shown, you know, taking um, the siloed approach that we have that's linked to digital products and trying to create a coordinated and much more networked approach, which makes it easier uh, and really seamless for us to adopt um, digital health tools that could be helpful. Uh, moving right along. So the priorities, just click that again for me and Amanda. Um, these are, oops, sorry, yeah. So we're, we are focusing on making sure in Ontario, everybody knows about the OLIS Clinical Viewer. Chandy spoke to that. You know, it is widely available, great adoption in terms of the labs. Um, again, uh, anybody can use that anywhere. There's a lot of activity in terms of an HRM uh, health report manager, as indicated, works really well, super well, probably a bit too much. So we're working on trying to decrease with Ontario MD and others, the duplication of some of those reports and, and make that uh, re reduce a little bit of the information that we have. We also are looking at e-consult and e-referral. So we'll move on. Um, so that's really in a snapshot what Ontario is doing, and um, I'm really happy to be involved with the team and, and leading it. We are, I'm going to give snapshot just briefly, and then there will be time for questions for what, what else is happening. So I mentioned Nova Scotia. I think Nova Scotia has done um, a great job in the last year in terms of reducing physician burden. Um, if you haven't seen some of their things, go on their website and take a look. Um, but this is their mandate by the end of 2024, reducing physician red tape by 400,000 hours a year um, and giving an equivalent of, of opening up 1.2 million patient visits. And some of the things that they've done, which I think are really in, of interest, is the legislation to eliminate the use of medical notes, um, trying to shorten uh, 28 different disability forms. And you should see the forms that we have to do as, as doctors. There are so many different ones, but made one standard form. They also have allowed, um, one of the things that was really interesting to me was that people could um, be put on a list for long-term care placement um, uh, without having to do, without the physician having to fill out uh, a very long form right away um, and allowing others to be able to do some of the work. So really team-based approach. 
Um, and you can see some of the other things that they're doing here, but a lot of work happening. And we're um, really interested in what's going on in other places, again, so that we can break down the silos between the provinces and we should be sharing um, what's working and what's not working with each other to have an impact on a national level. Next slide, please. British Columbia has done a tremendous amount um, of work in terms of um, uh, strengthening the workplace. And there's just a few things here. I'll highlight again that they have uh, done a very interesting provincial insurance corporation of BC to try to reduce admin burden related to insurance forms. Uh, that has really helped. Also found it really interesting that they have a business pathways initiative to help doctors navigate the operational aspects of running a practice. Um, which can be very burdensome administratively as well, is that we, many doctors in the community are running small businesses. So anything we can do to improve that those aspects is going to be helpful. Moving along, Ooh, Manitoba has launched a provincial task force and they're starting to implement um, many of the recommendations with that as well. So lots of, again, that's hot off the presses from March 3rd, doctor's clerical duties cut by 10%. Um, so the more we can do that, I think the better off uh, we will be. Next slide. A shout out to the Canadian Medical Association who did launch a $10 million grant, the Unburdened Grant Program. And I believe um, it gave an opportunity for physicians to apply with their ideas of how they might actually decrease admin burden. Um, so we're just waiting to hear which teams got funded. And I think uh, it's, uh, again, very good approach to take ideas from people who are the frontline providers and see what we can do uh, to implement those. So more to follow on that. Next slide, please. Um, the CMPA is involved as well. And again, they released in December, 2023, talking about AI scribes and the use of them. And there's uh, a lot of interest, very promising work. Again, uh, um, being a, a really great project program being led by OMD in collaboration with Ontario Health and the ministry to look at the use of AI scribes in Ontario. Um, and I think the early results are, are highly encouraging. And again, CMPA has issued, you know, guide in terms of if you're going to sign up for it, what are the considerations in terms of um, consent, et cetera, for uh, your patients to use these. And these have been described as a game changer in terms of the clinical encounter. Um, so I think uh, more to follow on that one. Next slide, please. So I think what I just wanted to end with is that uh, we really feel that the future does look a lot brighter. So I'm ever the optimist. Um, things are moving along. We've got a lot of actions, lots of national level activity. Um, and uh, we need to keep going with it. And then my hot off the presses announcement was from, um, again, this is just from this morning at 1030. So the Ministry of, of Health has uh, again announced and given some of the updates in terms of the Patients Before Paperwork program um, calculation that we hope that will save doctors 95,000 hours um, that could be spent caring for more people. Um, and again, axing the facts, expanding our e-services, which is about our central intake, more referral consultation, looking at electronic forms, um, and accelerating the expansion of centralized waitlist programs. Um, they have also, I believe, are looking at eliminating, uh, from a policy perspective, uh, the use of sick notes as much as we are, are doing right now. So all moving in the right direction. I'm really proud to be part of the Ontario Initiative. I'm proud to be able to show a map of Canada to show what all of the other provinces are doing as well. Um, everybody should be working together on this. And I think together we can really make an impact. And uh, overall, it's to improve uh, the delivery of healthcare for our entire population. So with that, I thank you. And I think Chandy and I are open for questions. All right, thank you very much. I just stopped sharing my screen so that we can get to some of the Q&A questions. So I'm seeing lots of people have uh, asked questions. Um, so the first one is, um, uh, for Chandy specifically. So have you found that patient access to personal health data, e.g. lab results, DI reports through personal health record tools and tethered patient portals increased burden for, for physicians? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question because we're talking about access to your, uh, to your health. 
Um, so first I want to say I 100% believe that patients should have access to their medical health, their medical records, their results. Like that's not even a question here. Um, the issue with portals and technology to allow for that to me is really about the onboarding, the change management, the adoption. It's the people and process piece, right? So you have a technology, it works, it allows um, a patient to look for their lab results, they get it right away, they're informed, 100% agree with that. But then the people and process and the adoption part of that is that in some cases, they actually get the results before the physician does. So if a patient gets a result that's abnormal or there's this bright red abnormal that's written on it, they're going to worry. And so they call our offices, but we don't even have it. So one, we don't look too smart when they have the result and we don't have it. But also now we're scrambling to find those results and we're calling, we're downloading it. But if it just waited till the end of the next day, it would have come into our EMRs naturally. So and that's what I talk about, that people and process piece um, and that change management adoption piece. Like we can't just talk about a technology. We have to look at how is that going to be implemented? What are the consequences? What are the questions and where does the burden? And we're very good at technology, but not that second part. Um, and I would say that for all digital tools that, that allow access in between anyone. Great, thank you so much. So we have a few more questions here. Um, okay, so one person says, I was glad to hear the focus on clinician involvement in design and deployment of digital products. It's so important. What were the key findings of the recent AI scribe pilot? Is there a clear plan to expand both the scope and scale of digital assistance in primary care? Claire, do you want me to start on this one? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm going to hand that to you because your uh, OMD was leading uh, a lot of that yeah. work. So, Yeah, uh, so um, I'm glad that announcement came this morning because <laughs> until then I wasn't, uh, uh, we weren't uh, really talking about it quite a bit. Uh, but we are leading an AI scribe project um, along with Weave and ECE through funding, which is looking at AI scribe in the community and whether and developing an evaluation framework like is AI scribe really a great technology? Is it moving the needle and how should we step back and evaluate it from a use perspective, uh, from a privacy and policy and legal like contracts? Like I think that part, the regulatory piece is really important. And we're looking at that. We just finished phase one and we're entering phase two, which is actually using it in the in about 150 physician and nurse practitioner um, clinics to see how it's doing. So we haven't finished that yet. So we don't actually have any data that can be shared. Um, we're expecting it to wrap up in June and then it comes to the scale and spread. And I think that would be phase three or a future implementation of that is what would that look like? It's a great question. It's just a little bit early. So um, if we come back and talk about AI Scribe in June or July, I'll probably have better answers for that. But uh, yeah, definitely we're underway. And the preliminary, and, and, and Claire can chime in. I think AI Scribe is looking like a great technology, eh, Claire? That's right. Yeah, it um, generates quite excitement. It's a game changer. I think one of the most interesting things when I've been hearing um, about the results is how much it improves the, the encounter with your patient. Um, and so that is super interesting. I think there's a lot of potential on that one as well. If you can get it connected to some of the ordering of the, of the labs or imaging that we do, depending on what you need as actions coming out of the clinical encounter. And the other area, I think where we have a huge gap, which would be amazing if we could fill it, would be on the language capabilities. So many of them are um, offered now in English, French, but in Canada with our multicultural, um, you know, uh, with, with our multiculturalism and the multiple languages, wouldn't it be amazing? This could be used um, as a great way to uh, uh, do the translation and help with those communication and conversations. Um, so very, very promising uh, technology. Mm -hmm. 
And there's been a couple of comments also that we've gotten from some physicians who are talking about how it's bringing back that joy in medicine again. Um, and, and we had one physician comment that they were ready to walk away, kind of, you know, the slides that we were talking about earlier and how this technology actually makes them feel like, oh, they've got a couple of more years left into them before they take an early retirement, which I think is really, really strong um, to hear comments like that from physicians right now. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. So we're getting lots of questions and we won't have time to answer all of them, but we'll try our best. All right. So we have one. It's fax and e-fax workflow is incredibly refined over the years in FP offices. So replacing fax and e-fax requires a system that is nearly equivalent in ease of use. So they're asking, what is your strategy to balance cajoling change and building a replacement system that has uh, the many advantages and ease of use? Um, and do you feel that you have the time to make the product that good and wait for uh, FPs to adjust their workflow? I'm letting you take that one, Claire. I will tackle that one. Um, I think that's a great point about what the current system is and then whether or not you can get adoption of a digital health tool, um, you know, that or it needs to be equivalent or I would be hoping that it's going to be better. Um, so that would be, I think, absolutely, we need to do that. I think there are some uh, foundation pieces that are working quite well. A lot of the reasons why it may not work as well as we would like is related to the integration of the products and really being able to have um, a more seamless experience. So I think that that work is underway. I believe we have the time to ensure that we've got the right systems in place um, to eventually be replacing facts. And I'll just bring back... Um, you know, not to make clinicians uncomfortable, but I actually do want to make clinicians uncomfortable that uh, you should take a look at what your fax failure rate is. Even eFax has uh, errors associated with it. Uh, you should understand what that looks like in your own environment and then determine whether or not, um, you know, what the what the risk is in terms of uh, the type of uh, really on the fax failure rate, I think is the biggest one, plus the patient privacy breaches. So what I'm saying is that actually it, we have to, we have to move off, um, what these systems are from a workflow point of view, they might seem like they're, um, you know, presenting great value, but if you look at value from, uh, multiple different aspects, including patient safety, um, you might be actually questioning what you're doing right now. So a little discomfort, uh, being introduced. Um, and then I would just encourage folks who are on the phone or on this line, you know, get involved in your community, find out about what's happening. Uh, put your hand up to be part of the co-design to ensure that what is being designed and being put together um, does, I think, present a better value, better a better approach than what you're currently using. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, here's an important question. Uh, do you have any initial thoughts on how the various technology pieces will talk to each other in the province? Are you seeing the usage, the usage of interoperability standards becoming more advanced, or rather the standardization of the software used? That's a hard question. And <laughs> I feel like that's a topic in itself. <laughs> Um, I'll take a stab at it and then I'll hand it over to Claire. Um, it's a big, it's a big problem. We have so many EMRs, we have hospital systems, we have all this technology throughout the country within a province that doesn't meaningfully share data or talk to each other. And, and that is one of the biggest causes of burden. Um, I, I, the, it has been something that is a priority uh, with a lot of organizations and governments. So I think to start off, the problem has been identified. Everyone knows it's a problem and it is a priority. And then it comes down to, OK, how do we make those changes? So I think uh, interoperability standards are, are, are really a great place to start. And I know Kai Hai is currently working on that for federally. Um, I know that because I sit on their advisory, their clinical advisory group. So they're actually trying to create um, standards from that. Then there is another uh, digital um, interoperability group that right now is led by Canada Health Infoway with CMA. Um, which is actually looking at how to make this possible across the, the country and, and what does that mean? And, and what I like about that group is 
that they're looking at the technology part of it. So, okay, if we look at a tech part of it, everyone has a solution for that. Um, there's ways to do that. But it's that people and process piece that you probably hear me saying all the time. That's a big barrier. And if you don't look at the people and process of, okay, you can get the data out, but is what's the quality of the data you're getting out? Because if you're not getting great data quality out, do we really need to be interoperable? Uh, how do we change that? Those questions are actually also being tackled with this group, which is why I'm very excited about this new, uh, this, this working group that's there. Um, I'm not really answering your question. I'm kind of going around because I think there's many factors to it. Um, and that involves vendors and the creators of the technology. It involves government, the funders. It involves organizations like Ontario MD. It involves primary care, um, the doctors, the users. It's a much bigger problem. So I am hopeful that it is coming because we're we're slowly making them like patient summary is one that we're working on right now which looks like it's something that could happen in the next year or so um, but the bigger piece of interoperability I, I think there still needs to be a lot of discussion uh, i'm hoping claire has a, a smaller succinct answer to that but it's a big problem well, I would just agree with you, Chandy, and I think um, I think there were sort of two questions that the that were being asked, and what I would say is that I, I believe we're trying to tackle it on both levels. Um, more to follow. There is strong interest in Ontario to look at what the policy solutions would be, so that's um, I think will be part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's a big question for sure. Okay, a couple quick ones, and then I'll close us out with one um, really interesting question. So there were ask, asking about uh, where they can find the publication um, that you were sharing, the one from today on Acts the Facts. Um, I believe it's from the Government of Ontario. Do a follow-up and see what is publicly available on that one. That's the, the Deloitte okay. report, yeah. Okay, and they and someone else is also asking about sharing the evaluation framework. If that's uh, if that's something you can do for AI Scribe, we haven't. Uh, so that would be if it's for AI Scribe. Um, that's actually phase two. We're still developing that, so it will be shared, but probably not till later in the summer or early fall. Okay, great. So keep an eye out for that if you're looking for that framework. And speaking of AI assistance, I'm seeing uh, Neil's Otter Pilot has uh, helpfully summarized the discussion. Very cool tool. I'll have to check that one out for sure. Very interesting. I was okay. wondering about that one too. I was like, Who is Neil's <laughs> yeah, Otter Pilot? Was very interesting. <laughs> um, cool. I've never seen it in use, but it looks very, uh, very useful. That's for sure. Okay, so here is a question to just close us out. They're asking, um, what's your hope for where we'll be in uh, a year and in five years? And maybe what are the barriers to that? To that? that one is for you, Claire. And it's okay, from I'll dive friend, into that. Mohammed al Arakia, who's actually uh, working, uh, like he's part of ECE, who is uh, um, um, working on AI Scribe and uh, robotic process automation with us. Right. So in terms of Ontario and the patients before paperwork in the next year, um, what we're hoping for is that with the tools that are already widely available, that we ensure, um, you know, with a bit of a marketing campaign with some additional support for um, adoption and meaningful use that uh, all clinicians who would like to be using them and are, are using them to, to help with the delivery of care for their patients. So, you know, basic one is, again, the, the Ontario Lab Viewer, beautiful product, lots of information on it, available through the clinical viewer. Um, so let's just make sure that that folks do have the ability to to sign up for that. And that's that, that's just an example of one of the things that we're working on. Um, and then making the health report manager, um, again, working better for family doctors to reduce the number of reports coming in. A, again, very nice task force um, that uh, has been published that again, collectively we're working on. In five years, um, I would hope that we have stabilized the primary care system, that doctors and other team members are feeling well supported, um, that if we were to do another survey of the admin burden, that that would be reduced um, by a significant amount, 
Um, that there's joy back in family medicine, that we have improved the access issues in family medicine, and that the system is no longer um, dependent in terms of that fax volume. So potentially up to an 80% reduction or more in terms of the uh, use of faxes for healthcare reports. So big goals, um, but really important ones. And I think uh, there's a huge team of um of folks at Ontario Health and at the Ministry and in Ontario and partners who are working collaboratively uh, to try to get us that to that goal. Amazing. Thanks so much. All right. So we're at the end of our time. I'm just going to launch a quick poll for everyone to share their satisfaction. But uh, thank you so much to our two presenters. That was a really, really interesting discussion. And uh, I can tell that the audience um was really engaged. They had a lot of questions for you. So that's, that's excellent. I'm hoping to hear more about this, uh, this project. All right. A pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank <laughs> you course. so much for having us here. Great. Thank you so much. So just a couple quick notes. So we do have our online Digital Health Canada community. This is actually where you'll find the recording of this session, as well as all the previous uh, webinar Wednesday and industry showcase sessions. So if you want to revisit uh, this really great talk and uh, view the slides again, that's uh, where you'll be able to find the recording. And I'm hoping to see lots of you again next week on May 1st, enabling digital health patient engagement across the mental health journey. May is Mental Health Month in Canada, so I hope to see lots of you out there. And that's it for today. Thank you so much again. And Thank you. Uh, goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Chani. Bye-bye, everyone.